in the blank. You're not getting any younger, so... Tell people what you want. Hey, you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast a podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz, and every week I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people just like you who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey, you're not getting any younger. So let's make this an adventure. Ready? One thing I haven't really told you is sometimes I get really lonely. You might never guess that because I have all these social media friends and you see me in all these pictures with all of these people, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes I find myself feeling like there's nobody I can connect with, nobody who understands me, nobody in the world who has the same problems that I have. And that feeling, it's really scary. That's a lot of what we talk about on today's episode. Jillian Richardson is the founder of The Joy List, a weekly newsletter that features events that New Yorkers can go to by themselves and leave with a new friend. She's also the co-founder of the NYC Community Builders and the author of an upcoming book about the most powerful ways to create belonging. In this episode, we talk about why most Americans are secretly lonely, why making friends is so hard, how to get the courage to go to things solo, and of course, how we can get over the shame of admitting and talking about just how lonely we are. I wanna thank you, my podcast friends, for being there for me in the show and listening to it week after week. And if you love it, if you truly love it, make sure to subscribe and rate and review on iTunes. And also, come hang out with us in the secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group. I promise you'll leave with a new friend. True or false? Are most Americans lonely? True. Why do you think that is? Well, so there is a, um, I'm going to sound like such a research nerd right now. But there's a study conducted by this research group called Cigna uh, this year, and they found that 46% of Americans feel lonely sometimes or all of the time, which is like bananas. That is wild that that many people are lonely. It's wild, but for some reason I can totally see it. I just, I don't think people admit it, you know, like I don't think people straight out say I'm super lonely. Yeah, I think that's a big part of the problem is that there are not the spaces to have these conversations. I think right now there need to be safe spaces to have that type of conversation because there's still a lot of shame around admitting that we're lonely. So like to tell you like a quick story to kind of show that, I was at a conference on Saturday and my job was to facilitate a conversation with like 10 different women. And the question that I asked them was like, what is, like, how do you feel with the connection in your life right now? How do you feel with the amount of community in your life? And I shared the, a couple statistics about loneliness to kind of share that like, in case people do feel lonely, it's totally normal. And then half of the women in this circle, so like five out of the 10 women, said that they had issues connecting with people and that they felt lonely. And a couple of them started crying because they'd never had a space where they felt like it was okay for them to admit that they didn't feel like they had deep connection with people. Wow. That's, that's like so incredible. What, why do you think there is such a stigma about being lonely? Do you think that it's because on social media, everyone looks so happy or looks like they have a lot of friends? You know, why are people scared to come to the table and say, my gosh, I am, you know, in my 20s, I'm in my 30s, and I've never felt lonelier in my life. Yeah, and that's, it's so common, you know, I think just like the word lonely itself is kind of tied to there being something wrong with you as a person. Yeah. Like we say, oh, that person's a loner, meaning like they, like they're socially awkward, they don't fit in, they don't know how to listen to social cues, like maybe even they're dangerous, when really lonely just means that we are craving a thing that we all need as human beings, which is 
connection. It's so true. And when I was reading more about you, you, you've written places that the average person only has one close friend. And I read that and I smiled so wide because I talked about it on this show before and I've been open about it. But I feel like as I've gotten further into my 20s, now I'm in my 30s, I've been losing friends along the way. And it's crazy. I, I really think that friendship is something that as we get older, we don't make a priority. But why do you think that making close connections, making friends is hard for people to do? Well, so recently, because uh, I'm writing a book on this topic, and I had a conversation with a woman who works at Harvard Divinity School, and she does this program called Nuns and Nuns, uh, which is a little bit of a confusing name. It's a N-U-N-S, like nuns, like religious women, and N O N. Es meaning millennials who identify as none on the um, the spiritual spectrum, I guess you'd say. So they say like they do not have a religion, and she found that these millennials who are not religious actually have a lot to learn from nuns. Like they just had these amazing conversations, and she found that a thing that the millennials were a little bit almost jealous of from from the nuns and that I totally identify with myself is that the nuns have a vow to each other. They have a vow that they will stick with the same group of people. They know how they are going to behave. They're going to be taking care of each other. Like they are literally sisters in religion. And we don't have that with our friends. We don't have the friend version of marriage, which is a declaration that you are going to be sticking with someone. And we just don't have the rules. So I think, Speaking for myself, admitting to someone, hey, I want to be friends with you for decades. That feels very vulnerable and scary and almost like needy. Yeah. And that shouldn't be the case. Yeah. that's. I'm laughing because while I've been losing friends, I have a great friend named Carrie and I tell her all the time, please never stop being my friend. You know, if it ever gets to that point, like, let me know. I just... I think you're completely right about that is, is there's no pact. There's nobody saying like, hey, like, let's let's make this friendship thing work. And if there are times when we get on each other's nerves, let's communicate about it. Sort of like what makes a romantic relationship work, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I get that because then what happens, especially when we're, we start to get busy in life with other things like our career or relationships or whatever it is, we put our friends on the back burner and it causes a bunch of resentment. Um, One of the things that you've spoken about is that you started going to things by yourself, which I think is the coolest thing in the world. I remember the first time I went to the movies by myself or a concert by myself. It felt so weird. I felt like everyone was looking at me thinking, hey, why is this person here by themselves? But they're not. And, And when you went to things by yourself, how did you get the courage to do that? And how did it change your life? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think... For me, it's like working a muscle. Like the more I did it, the more comfortable I was with it until eventually I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. Um, but I think I'm kind of a, a like all or nothing person. And so I started going to things by myself by going to a festival by myself. Wow. So I just like <laughs> was like, I'm going to do a three day thing by myself and see what happens. Uh And I think it just showed me how when I don't have another person as a crutch, I am, I meet so many more people. Like, so at this festival, I went by myself. I stayed in a cabin that they specifically had for people who went by themselves. So it was like me with all these other, this ragtag group of people who showed up to this festival. And I was like, oh man, I think I really noticed is that I got amazing at remembering people's names because I needed to. I was like, I don't know anyone here. Somehow my brain is like firing at double capacity. And I, like, I remember the security guard's names, like the lifeguard's name, everyone in my cabin. Um, So I was like, my goal here is to make a lot of friends and like actually connect with people. And I don't have anyone to lean on. Otherwise it's just me. And it was an amazing weekend and I made so many connections. 
It's so wild because I feel like I'm secretly an introvert and I feel like when I have a friend with me, I am like, okay, you're my safety blanket. I'm never going to talk to anyone else here. But when I have to go by myself, like I've paid the money like you did for the festival and I'm there, you sort of have to wake up a little bit and say, okay, how can I make the best of it? So what advice do you have for people who are going to events themselves or going to even three-day festivals themselves? What can they do, especially if they are a little bit more on the introverted Side. Yeah, I would say one is just know that you and everyone there have something in common. If you're at an event, you already have something to talk to everyone about. So if you're at a concert, like turn to the person next to you and say, like, hey, uh, I haven't listened to this new album yet. Like, I have to admit, like, what do you think about it? Or, oh my gosh, I went to a show of this person's last year. Ooh, some very loud ice was <laughs> just dumped behind me. Um, like I went to a show of this person's last year. This thing happened. Have you been to one of their shows? Yeah. Um, and people go to events because they want to talk to other people. Like it's not like you're in a co-working space and people are trying to get their work done. They're there. They're out. They're socializing. I think, and again, speaking for myself, I had this belief of people don't want to talk to me. They don't want to be bothered. Mm-hmm. When really, if you're in an event, people are excited to make new connections, but everyone has this fear of being vulnerable and putting themselves out there and being rejected. Yeah, and I think that you are truly the pro at this because you run the Joy List, which allows you to create a bunch of events all over New York City, a city where people, I think, are the loneliest. So tell us what is the Joy List and why did you start it? Yeah, so the Joy List is my weekly newsletter of events that you can go to by yourself and leave with a new friend. Mm -hmm. And I started it really because for me, events changed my life. So when I moved to New York, I didn't have really any close friends except for one. I was struggling to find a sense of deeper connection. And when I stumbled on this summer camp for adults called Camp Grounded, uh, which is like a digital detox camp. You don't talk about work. You don't talk about age. It's just three days of people being playful in the woods. And the culture of that weekend just completely transformed the way I looked at adulthood and what I thought was possible for myself as an adult, because I'd recently just graduated from college. And while I didn't realize it at the time, it was one of the first things that made me realize how much an event can transform the way that I experienced the world. And then after that, I just kept going to new events because I was kind of like, I was, I was hooked. I was addicted to this feeling of really being in spaces where I could connect with people and I wanted to find them. So once I did find them, I wanted to share that hard work with other people who maybe aren't (laughs) as nuts as me and had all the time and the energy and the privilege of, finding these spaces. That's amazing. And and you said it completely true, which is, you know, moving to New York City. I think a lot of people think, okay, I'm going to move there. I'm going to just make friends so easy. But even in big, big cities where there are millions of people, especially people your age, it becomes so hard to make friends. So when you were starting this newsletter and you were going to all of these events, What were some of the things that you did to make sure that you not only met new people, but you left there with new friends? Yeah, I think I was just making sure that I was showing up at events that had a facilitated moment of connection. For me, events that have some element of facilitation are so powerful because the person who is leading the event gives everyone there permission to get deeper with each other. I think it's a little bit awkward or maybe a lot awkward to go up to a stranger at a bar and say, Hey, what was the most difficult thing that happened to you this week? But if you're at an event that's facilitated and the person at the front of the room says, Hey, turn to somebody, ask them the hardest part of their week. Yeah. I feel like for me, I don't really think about it. It's just like, Oh, okay. Awesome. This is our prompt. And immediately I am in deeper connection with this person. Uh, so that was a thing that I started finding made me feel more deeply connected. And so those were the only types of events that I decided to highlight in my newsletter is things where people have permission to deeply connect with others, because I think we're so conditioned to not 
that it's really hard to get there naturally. I agree. I can't even tell you how many events I've signed up for that I was going to go to solo that weren't like that. You know, events that are just happy hours or, you know, Mm -hmm. stop by or watch a movie or listen to a talk that I couldn't bring myself to go to because the thought of walking in there, not knowing anybody, not having anybody sort of help me out really, really freaked me out. So Mm -hmm. I I appreciate that about your kind of events is that when people go, they know that they're going to go for a purpose of of meeting people and being open to people. This is my question for for those kind of events, because (laughs) I could shake a hand, I could say hello. How in the world do you keep conversation flowing? Do you have any tricks that people could start to use so that there aren't awkward silences when they're going to these events and talking to people there? Yeah, I would say really what makes a great conversation for me is when the person is genuinely curious about who I am. I think it's kind of clear when someone is starting a conversation and they're just like, they don't like uncomfortable silences and they don't like standing by themselves. So they're just turning to someone and kind of saying by default, like, Hey, what do you do? Like, what's your job? Um, those kind of conversations aren't fun for anyone. But if someone turns to me and they say, like, hey, where did you grow up? And then they follow that up with, how did growing up in that place impact you as a person? I'm like, oh, okay, now we're having a real conversation. Like, now this is actually, like, you, you're curious about how where I grew up influenced me. And that just shows a level of care for the other person that I think not a lot of people take the time or the energy to show. Definitely. I feel that the best thing you can do when you're talking to a stranger is just listen to them, you know, because Mm -hmm. a lot of times we're thinking of how do we end that awkward silence? What do we say next? When truly the best conversations we have are when we, like you said, we just ask, we act curious and we Mm -hmm. just follow up asking people to dive into the conversation more. Mm -hmm. But this is a question that I get a lot from people is how do you end a conversation, right? Like you've been talking to one person for 25 minutes. Do you want to go talk to somebody else or, you know, it's just the conversation's going south. How do you politely end the conversation with somebody? Yeah. I would say if you don't actually have another person to talk to in the room, I think for me, a thing that always works is like, Hey, thank you so much. Like this has been awesome. Um, I have to run to the bathroom. I'll like find you later on in the night. Um, like I feel like that's always a pretty foolproof way to get out of a conversation. Or if you actually do have someone else in the room that you want to talk to saying, Hey, this conversation has been awesome. I just noticed that my friend is here and I promised that I would say, hi, do you mind if I chat with you later? Um, I feel like that's, that's always a good way to graciously get out with saying like, Hey, I need to end this conversation. Definitely. And my fear is that they're going to say, Oh my God, you have to go to the bathroom. I'll go too. And then that's, mm. <laughs> that's like no, my please biggest get fear. Out of my face. Yeah. I'll be like, Oh, this is, this just got even more awkward, but I completely agree. You know, I, I, I'm the weirdo who, before I go to any social situations, I have like a list of questions I'm going to ask people, have a list of ways I'm going to get out of it. You know, I am planning ahead so that when I'm there, I'm not like trapped into something or any of that. But what about body language tips? You know, you, you are the pro at making friends when you go to events. What kind of good body language should people have so that they seem open? Because I've, I've gone to events before where people are sort of hiding on their phone or their arms are crossed. What can people do to, to show that they are inviting and welcoming to people with their body? Yeah. To be honest, it's not a thing that I think about very often. And what you said about phones is huge. Yeah. I think for me, if I show up at an event by myself and I don't have anyone to talk to, I, of course, reach for my phone. It's such a crutch. It's like, oh, look, I have an important thing to look at. I'm not being socially awkward. I just got a very urgent message that I need to look at. Um, so I would say, I just, that's why I love being in spaces where phones are not allowed. Yeah. Because it prevents that from happening. Um, other than that, I would say, for me, like this sounds very awkward and it can feel really uncomfortable but from an outside perspective it's not it's literally just like 
just standing there and looking at people yeah like and just breathing and just noticing if I feel uncomfortable because really there is nothing weird about in a room of crowded people just standing there by yourself for a moment just like checking out the room and taking a few breaths uh I think for me, I often feel like, oh, no, I need to be talking to someone at all times. And if I'm not, then people think I'm weird and they think that I'm like socially awkward and then people are going to be afraid to talk to me. And it turns into this anxiety spiral when really you can just stand there and breathe and feel comfortable in yourself. Yeah, I think I think exactly what you said about the eye contact is huge. You know, sometimes when I feel like I'm insecure, I look down, I look up. But the key, like you said, is just to stand there and look at people and smile. And it doesn't make you look mm-hmm. like a creep. It just makes you look like, you know, you're happy to be there and you're welcoming and inviting for people to come talk to you. I love the name The Joyless. My mom's middle name is Joy. It's always been a word no. that I've loved. What what made you name it this? Why why did you call it The Joyless? Yeah, it was funny. I was thinking about like the unlonely list or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but I had a friend say, no, you should name it what you should name it after what you want to happen, not what the problem is. Oh, I like so, that. Right? I was like, oh, that's really good advice. It's just framing it as a positive. And I was thinking maybe like something about community or connection, but I feel like there are already so many organizations and lists that have those words in there. And I was just thinking, okay, like what's a result of reducing loneliness and what's a result of creating connection? And for me, it's joy because that's what I've found is I've created my own communities. I love that. I think it's, I, I really love that you uh, named it after the, what you get out of it over the problem. I think that that's amazing business advice. So on that, <laughs> what if, what have you learned personally from running the joy list? Ooh, yeah. I mean, I think recently for me, I've been just learning how to like forgive how overused I feel like this phrase is. Um, but I feel like I've been learning how to step into my power more, Mm. how to own my leadership, which is something that feels very difficult and scary, uh, especially because I've been leading my own events more and everyone who's there is someone who's from the newsletter and they're people who know me. They know actually way more about me than I know about them. And knowing how to make people feel comfortable, how to just be comfortable in the fact that people came to this event partially to meet me and know that it's not really about me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> There's a very New loud York sirens. <laughs> we'll let it pass. And... There we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think I've been struggling with this concept of like being a leader and just trying more to learn that I represent what is possible for people, which is making friends, creating community. That's it's something that I struggle with. Even just like calling myself a leader is something that I still kind of squirm around in my seat when I say it. But I think I just the newsletter represents this the sense of community that a lot of people are looking for and just learning how to how to be comfortable in that and stand in that is is a new thing for me especially as more opportunities are starting to come my way and like public speaking and working with companies like doing consulting it's all it's all super new to me. Like I'm in the very early stages of all of this. So I'm still kind of struggling to get my sea legs. Do you ever feel a lot of pressure when people are coming to these events? Most of them coming at least to just meet you for the first time too. Do you ever feel a lot of pressure to be a certain kind of person or to always be on when you're at your events? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I think honestly at my events, I don't struggle with it as much because it's such a time. It's such a short amount of time that I'm like, I feel like I can, I can kind of turn on for like three or four hours and it's okay. What I really struggle with is 
being just in life and somebody from the newsletter is at an event that I'm at yeah. and maybe like something, maybe I'm sad. Maybe I'm distracted and not focused. Maybe I'm just really wanting to talk to my own current friends and I don't have the bandwidth for like a really good connection with somebody else at the moment. That's a thing that I struggle with. Uh, and like what an amazing problem to have, but it's definitely something that I'm, I'm learning to navigate how to like kind of gracefully be in a quick conversation with someone who might want to have a longer conversation. I just don't have the energy to commit to that. Girl, I feel you. I've, I've had that happen in, in so many, so many different ways. I, I always get scared meeting people in person who have read my blog or my book. And it happened to me yesterday. I was at a workout class. I'm visiting Chicago. And the teacher walked up to me and was like, oh, you're the girl that wrote that book. And I thought, oh, no, you know, she knows who I am. And now during the whole workout class, I have to, you know, really prove that I'm mm-hmm. in shape when really I sort of wanted to sleep in the back of class. And, you know, so that's like a different, a different situation than yours, but similar in the sense that sometimes people expect you to be somebody, especially as an entrepreneur. And, you know, we have off moments too. And have you found any tricks of how you've been able to sort of, you know, still live your personal life, go to events and and maintain that professionalism, but also get in some personal moments too? Yeah, I think a thing that I've been practicing more is like really, if I'm talking to a person who I'm really excited to be having a conversation with, really focusing my attention on them and like not letting my attention wander. Um, and if I can see that kind of there's someone in my peripheral vision who's standing waiting to chat to just turn to them and say, Hey, uh, I want to let you know that I see you. And I promised this person that I would give them my undivided attention. Like, do you mind if we chat in maybe 10 minutes? Uh, so the person knows that they're acknowledged and the person who I am currently talking to still feels valued. Uh, and that's the thing that I still, when I do it, I'm like, Oh man, does this person think I'm essentially telling them to like get the book away from me? <laughs> like I'm, I'm worried about seeming me. And when in reality, I'm just setting a personal boundary. I agree. I think sometimes, you know, people have always told me personally, it's not what you say, it's how you say it, you know, and it's sometimes it's Mm -hmm. like, how do you tell a person like, hey, I'm going to talk to you in a couple of seconds, I just got to wrap this up. And it can be it can be hard to do. I think it's something that we learn just by practicing over and over again at some points. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing, like, I don't know if you feel this way, too. But I think especially because my personal brand is all about like inclusion and joy and happiness that I worry that if I don't seem that way, or like if I am not putting out that kind of energy all the time, people will think that I'm a fraud. Yeah. Oh yeah. I I have that too. I mean, especially because I write nonfiction. So people read these stories, they think they know a hundred percent of me and then they meet me in person. And it's like, that's only like 10% of me. And I, I feel like I'm constantly disappointing people. So Mm. I, I get it. You know, I, I try honestly not to meet people in real life because <laughs> I'm so nervous about that. That's why I can't imagine you doing it all of the time because I'm sure it catches up with you. Yeah, I think I've definitely, as the popularity of the newsletter has grown and I've done more public facing events, I've needed way more introvert time by yeah. myself. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Time to just sit there and not talk to anyone and sort of turn off, which I think helps you turn on probably more in public, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. You wrote the book Unlonely Planet. Tell us about what the book is about and why people should pick this up and read it. Yeah. Well, so the book is actually still being written right now. It has not come out. Um, it will be, fingers crossed, published in March. And the book is about one kind of the state of loneliness in America right now, kind of giving a little bit of a breakdown of what's going on. Then the middle is all the middle. (laughs) The middle is all about these new spaces where people are doing an amazing job of creating a sense of belonging. And the, and is all about how people can step into leadership themselves and create the spaces that they want to see in the world. 
That's amazing. Well, we can't wait for it to come out, and I love, I love the title of it, too. One of the quotes I heard you say somewhere that I wanted you to talk about because I absolutely loved it is, whatever your problem is, you're not the only one. That is mm. such a powerful thing to say. Can you tell us what do you mean by that and, and why should people understand that? Honestly, it is so funny because when I said that, it was totally just like off the top of my head. And I think you saw it became kind of like the title quote for this short that a friend, like a short film that a friend made about me. And I've had so many people message me about that line, which kind of cracked me up because to me, I was like, oh, this is just something that I kind of said offhand that sounds super obvious. Like if you have a problem, you are not the only person with that problem. Um, but it's not obvious. I think it's a reason why I love going to events with strangers and having the chance to have deep conversations with strangers is because it reminds me of our shared humanity and that we're all going through similar problems. But because our culture is so individualistic, we don't have the chance to have those conversations with people very often. So we forget. Not only do we forget, but then we go on social media where everyone's life just seems like amazing and where we think to ourselves, we are definitely the only one with this problem, you know? And mm -hmm. I think it stems back to loneliness is and very few people are willing to admit, hey, I feel lonely because you go on social media and everyone seems to have a million friends. But to admit that maybe you have one really close friend or maybe you don't have any, that that's hard because I think we just live in a world right now where it's, it's hard to be vulnerable like that. And that's why I think the quote is so powerful is because people don't remember that anymore because that's not what they're seeing when they're spending quality time on their phones. Quality time on their phones. You know, it's so true. The, um, the conference that I mentioned earlier where like five of the 10 women admitted that they struggle with loneliness. Two of those women were close friends. Like they came to the event together yeah. and they turned to each other and they were like, wait, you're lonely. I'm lonely too. Yeah. And they were both empty nesters whose children had recently gone to college, but they, they, they were going through the exact same experience and they were friends and they still felt so ashamed of their loneliness that they couldn't even tell their best friend about it. Like, what does that say about our culture? Oh, it's so true. And I feel so guilty because I feel like when people look at my social media or they think they know about my life, they probably think I have a million friends and I have a boyfriend. So how could I be lonely? But there are some times when I think I'm the loneliest person on the planet. So I mm. think I need to do a better job too of communicating that to people, even friends and saying, Hey, I'm lonely. Can you talk? You know, I think, I think that I even have to do a better job of that and, and your advice and everything you said and even what you do has totally inspired me to, to be more open about that. Jillian, I just, I have a couple more final questions for you. So I want to end this on a lightning fire round. I'm going to ask you some questions and respond with whatever comes to mind first. <laughs> All right, deal. When you were a kid, what did you want to grow up to become? I wanted to be a writer. Nice. What's your dream job now? Being the me millennial version of Brene Brown. <laughs> what is the best advice anyone has ever given you? Um, mm, I'll say you're making your own. Oh, what was it? I think it's if you can see the path, you're doing it wrong. Something along those lines. Like if you're truly living your own life, you're going to be creating a path that no one else has made before. So it's going to be scary. You're, make, you're, you're making your own path. Love it. My final question for you. Fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So. Tell people what you want. I love it. Jillian, thank you so much. Please tell our listeners where they can find out more about you, The Joy List, and your book coming out in March, Unlonely Planet. Yes. So you can find The Joy List at joylist.nyc. And on Instagram, we are joylistnyc. Facebook, we are just The Joy List. Uh, and the book will be published in March. So you can find out about that by also subscribing to The Joy List. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. 
Subscribe, rate, and review that you're not getting any younger podcasts on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen too. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glantz.